Welcome to the Human Performance Outliers podcast with your hosts, Dr. Sean Baker and Zach Bitter. At Human Performance Outliers podcast, we dive into a wide range of topics revolving around health, nutrition, and physical fitness. If you enjoy the show and wish to support us, please visit patreon.com forward slash HPO podcast. If you do not use Patreon but still wish to support us, please also consider checking out our PayPal page at paypal.me forward slash HPO pod. The link to both of those can also be found in the show notes. Finally, please consider subscribing to us on your favorite podcast listening platform. Now on to the next topic. I guess we, if we go by Marcus, can yep. you, for uh, for the sake of our audience and may not be familiar with you, just go ahead and do a quick, you know, a couple minute introduction and then we can kind of talk about your story, I suppose. Okay. Um, I mean, let's keep it on the vegan topic, I guess, um, cause that seems to be where most of these people are probably tuning in. I mean, I went vegan 20 years ago at 25 and, um, uh, I was, you know, it was because my, my bowels were not feeling good given what I was eating before, which was total junk. Um, I mean, I was one of those gifted type athletes where I could eat anything. I mean, junk and still be in great shape and uh, not really not have a, a problem with it. But uh, at, at some point at 25, my bowels felt like garbage. And then I was like, okay, I need to start looking at what's the healthiest option for me to, to live and eat. And also, cause I wanted to win a track and field, which probably vegan has hurt me, you know, prevented me from fulfilling what I could have done. And now that I'm an older man of 45, studying all of the science of regeneration, I'm still going for it, but now I've got the nutrition right. So um, 20, 20 years ago, it was all the rave because I remember Do- uh, Bill Clinton was even going vegan in the news because it was supposed to cure his heart. And so um, I you know, bought the whole program. Like I was living in LA at that time and I was like, okay, this is probably really good for the animals. It's good for me. It's the optimal way of a personal trainer. I can like help other people learn about it. And that's part of the reason why once I started coming out of the vegan, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a reality. It's a psychology. Um, it's almost like a, you're, you're in some f- form of mental hostage, actually. So once I come out of it, uh, I look back at it like, well, I've been this figure that a lot of people have looked to for health and wellness and tips. And I'm, you know, I'm in decent shape, obviously. Um, but I don't want people to end up still following that pathway that I was like, Hey, yay, vegan is great. And without being responsible and say, Hey guys, look, there's some real serious hazards when you get further down the road on this pathway. Um, I mean, I was, I was beginning to feel heart issues. I had a varicose vein I had to get taken care of. All my joints were beginning to hurt. So when I started to see you, you know, I know you have your clash with vegans. I was never one of those vegans that wanted to be um, mean to other people just because of dietary choice. I was more like, okay, I understand you want to eat meat, but I'm doing this vegan thing because of the science. Um, And so... Now I just feel very responsible to, you know, having watched a couple of your podcasts, I was like, okay, this guy seems like he's saving people's lives. And in many ways, your influence, when I first started watching, I thought, this guy's nuts. <laughs> like, I've got to see this. I'm like, this guy's crazy. It's great. But I started to notice because when I watch people's uh, physicality, that's a big indication to me as to whether they're on the right path or the wrong path. So if you're breaking records, I'm like, okay, I'm tuning in. I've never seen anybody over 50 in your shape breaking records. And so I was like, okay, I better, you know, try this. And then it was, it's been, it's a psychological battle. Even I had to like drag my wife out of veganism because we were all like, yeah, well, this is the healthiest way. And, uh, you know, it's really, it's really obviously not. Um, so it's kind of like you're eating humble pie having to like go, well, you know, 
if my if my body is not feeling right and I'm not feeling optimal, then how long have I been off course? And um, so obviously I'm about like 80, 90% carnivore. I still eat a little bit of plants because I feel like I don't want to go from one extreme to the absolute other extreme without enough scientific data that if I go too far the other way, I might end up in trouble again, kind of once bitten, twice shy. Um, but that's my my vegan sort of history. Other than that, you know, it's been a case of me being soap operas, entertainer, you know, magazines. I did CSI Miami, lots of films that rotated on BET. So there is an, an audience out there that knows me, but they know me for maybe, in, in, you know, a soap opera pinup boy, um, actor, and somewhat of a physique, nutritional, you know, I guess. Tell me a little bit more about you said track and field. What were you, what were you doing back? I guess that was in your, you know, college, high school type time. What, what was that about? Well, um, my father's a karate teacher, so I was raised by a karate teacher. Extremely disciplined. Um, my father's British. My mother's Jamaican, so I'm British Jamaican. And uh, I became a British Taekwondo champion when I was 16 in the men's heavyweight division. So, you know, since young, I've been like, literally, like my father almost trained me like a ninja, like mentally and uh, discipline wise, just like very regimental. And in some ways I'm a little OCD because of that, I think. But at a certain point, well, I beat a world champion when I was 17, named um, Nathan Lewis Megatron. And even though I won on points, I just remember like taking a hell of a beating and thinking, you know, do I really want to be a professional fighter? You know, I've got the ability, but I think I'm going to end up brain damaged. You know, by, by being a champion, I'll be brain damaged. And um, so I just thought, let me slow down on the fighting and get into track and field. And, um, you know, I coming from England, we don't have the collegiate system the way you do uh, over here. I mean... If my accent goes in and out of England, it's because I've been in America 20 years, but born in England. Um, so that has, I have had to learn the American mindset, which is very different to the European mindset, just like you just came back from a, a, a trip to Malaysia. So you probably were immersed in a different culture. British culture is just very different. So learning American culture has almost been like, even though it's the same language, it's like learning a completely different culture. But I got in the track and field just independently. I posted a, a 10 3 7 and become a, a, in the Open S South Florida Championship for 100 meters. And at the time, Mike Westoff from the Miami Dolphins called me up and said, You're 210 pounds running 10 3 7. I need you on the team. <laughs> and I was like, Really? I was like, I have never done any football. You know, I have no idea how to do football. I, I know how to um, I know how to hit people, but uh, martial arts. But I mean, uh, and then I, he sent me to Atlanta Combine and I, I ran a 4-4. Can you believe that? I ran a 4-4 and had not, no clue what a 4-4 meant. I just wish <laughs> I showed up at a Combine from England, ran a 4-4 and had no clue that I was this close to a world record. You know, I really didn't. I was just powerful. But that was when I was eating meat. You know, I lived on a very high sort of chicken base at that time. Chicken. I remember I would go to... um. El Pollo Truck Call in uh, Florida. And uh, so I was like, Jack, powerful, fast. Then I, I met a couple of like very high profile vegan uh, advocates. I don't want to mention their names because I don't want to, I don't want to put any disparity out on people. Um, but they were like, you know, you're going to be really good if you go raw, get your, you know, get your nutrition raw, live on, cacao and honey <laughs> and um so i was like really okay well there was a lot of credibility to them as people you know so i went down that pathway and to begin with i think that because of all of those phytochemicals the toxins or whatever that are in the plants you flush out and cleanse and i felt phenomenal maybe i was you know because i stopped eating fast food but um after year 10, that's when the problems really started occurring. Joints, Achilles tendon chronic, having to take time off of track. Every time I would run a track session, pop a hamstring, pop a groin, and pop uh, um, 
or a, a calf muscle. And I would always be like blaming myself because I tend to look, live in a place where I'm like, okay, I'm responsible. I either didn't warm up or I overtrained. That was my mindset. So I blamed myself, not the diet, thinking, well, everyone gets injured at some point, you know. In hindsight, now looking at all these athletes, you know, I saw you speaking on, um, what's the, Cam Newton. I can, I can like look at that from a, a person who went 20 years vegan. I can be like, well, yeah, you're going to get destroyed. Because by the time I got to like year 19, I was feeling so brittle, like here, brittle. And even bone wise, I was like, I'm not the guy I used to be. It's coming back, you know, like a year later of eating meat. Like the first thing I could tolerate was salmon. I'm like, I'm going to get into salmon. And um, that first week I went back to track and I was like, okay, damn, bouncy again. Like, this is different, you know, something so different. No matter what they say about you getting all the amino acids from mixing beans with rice or corn or whatever it was, you know. You're not, you're clearly not getting the nutrients that's required. That's what I found. And um, towards the end of it, it, it felt like, it felt like coming from being an athlete that could run a 4-4 and could really smash and take a beating. Because I used to take a lot of beatings just, you know, to, just to, uh, to mix it in there with the heavyweights. And um, by the time I'd, hit 43, 44, I felt so brittle that I felt like something would pop quick. I even picked up my little son, put him in his car seat, and maybe I'd been doing cleans the day before, so I was like sore. But picking up Titan, this thing popped out. like, And I was just like, oh my God, are you serious? I just started to feel like I was becoming unglued. And then my wife was like, let's look at what you could be deficient in. And it was all collagen, collagen, collagen. I'm like, okay. And the further I dove into collagen, at first I was trying to stay vegan and drink collagen. You know what I mean? Like, okay, let's drink collagen, stay vegan. And then I started waking up like, this, this doesn't make any sense. There's some kind of, uh, I'm, I'm missing something here. Like, it's, it's a di cognitive dissonance. And so, as I became more accepting of the meat. It was both a psychological journey, like to take off these blinkers or something. It's like you're living like this, you know? And uh, I'd say that the science and the backup and the fact that like friends that used to be friends suddenly leave you. Like, okay, we're not going to be a friend anymore because you choose to eat meat. I'm like, it's a bit weird. Like, were you ever my friend? Like, so you, you go through these, you know, were you ever really my friend? Because that's a psychological trapping, you know? And um, like, there's just so many things that I can say change when you come back into the meat camp, mentally, physically, and my heart feels better. My joints now, I'm like, like I ran a four six. So I'm like, okay. I can get this thing back. I can, I can like stop getting injured all the time, you know? And uh, it's just kind of like a rebirth. That's why I said to you, hey, I'm concerned about this whole Arnold Schwarzenegger, James Cameron push on veganism because having done it tw almost 20 years, I'm like, there's going to be a lot of people dying early or having other problems and i think that because i had a lot of money especially at the hollywood time i was able to extend my veganism longer than most due to supplementation because i could spend a lot of money on supplements at the time just yeah okay you know that's what i was gonna is sorry to interrupt marcus that's what i was gonna ask though because like you know we've had like tim sheaf on the show and uh bobby risto on the show who are like you know fit and in Tim's case, you know, a legit athlete following a vegan diet and they tend to, they seem to kind of fizzle out from it quite a bit sooner. Whereas you know, 20 years is like long enough where if it's a progressive decline, you know, there's a lot of things you could attribute it to outside of diet. So, well, I'm getting older, this, that, and the other thing. 
did you notice like some of those things creeping up or was it kind of like one day you woke up and you're like, well, yeah, everything hurts. Why is that? I'd say, um, you know, I was, I was with a track and field club. I was born in 27, 28. So I just started going vegan then. And I'd started getting Achilles tendon pain, right? You know, then. And uh, I'd have to tell the coach, man, my Achilles is killing me. So I think he was definitely overtraining me. But it was still something like looking back in hindsight. I was looking over my notes because there's so many things I really wanted to touch upon. And, uh, and in hindsight, it's kind of like, sorry there. Um, it's kind of like you're, you're looking back on a, a, psycho, a psychology that you're having to not only um, pull yourself out from, from the hostage that you're under, but also I feel like you get more brain cognition. You, so as, as I started getting the eggs back into the diet and I was researching a guy named Dr. Joe Wallach, that fat, that omega, that myelin sheath, you literally start feeling like maybe, you know, your brain was actually like deteriorating. And it's, it's one of those humble things to look back on like, you know, what cloud was I living in? Um, uh, I, I kind of likened it to feeling like going from being a cow to feeling like a wolf. And, and obviously from a vegan point of view, you know, you're like, oh, well, it's nice to be a cow or let's be a more glorious animal. Let's be a, a, an elephant or a horse, you know, because they're majestic. So you want to be a majestic animal or, or at least liken yourself to it or a gorilla. Yeah. And then I started realizing that they're actually insectivores. Um, but when you come to more becoming a wolf, it's somewhat discerning in the sense you're like, I'm, I'm a savage now, you know? Like, that's a psychological journey to have to, I'd say, uh, be at peace with recognizing that we as human beings are hunters. We are like, you know, we're like the wolves in the sense that if we were out in the wild, we'd have no choice but to be a wolf. Whether we were tribal about it or individual, there's a, a, a cognitive change that comes about. Yeah, you know, we actually had a guy on the show just recently named Dr. Bill Schindler, and he was just going through some of the kind of the, just the history of like uh, how humans have evolved to be where we are today and kind of like what types of foods would be available just out in, out in the wild, so to speak. And uh, even the tribes that he worked with that were you know, more plant-based or that's what they had the most access to, were going through these like really detailed processes in terms of preparation and things in order to essentially like liberate the, the food and eliminate some of the, the negatives of, of what they were eating. And it was, uh, it was just interesting to kind of hear him describe some of that stuff and just talk about the different things that people would, would do and just the different mindsets you'd have when, if you were just actually, actually that close to your food system where you needed to find it yourself versus just go to the grocery store and, you know, get this supplement and that and all these other things. I mean, that cognitive change for me was very real. Like, especially this week. Um, I'm really just observing myself as a being, as a father, as somebody who is like at the head of my family's health and wellness. I mean, it was definitely something I had to go through a major shift. And um, I would say that all the human beings that are getting ready to jump on the whole vegan thing, just, you know, I've had to eat a lot of humble pie because being a health professional, it's like my job is to put out their information to people like, hey, you can, um, you'll be better if you're vegan. And then to have to retract those statements and say, man, I'm sorry, you're not going to be better if you're vegan. Long term, you're going to probably suffer as I did. So um, it's, it's, I don't really want to put out there in a negative way like, you know, vegans are stupid the same way I sometimes see Sean <laughs> into battles, you know, only because there are vegans that clearly are pretty stupid. Um, I mean, I saw one time a lady was letting a mosquito bite her and saying, yes, feed, feed. And I was just like, okay, that just lost their mind. Um, but 
for some vegans that are actually looking at it from a health point of view and some of them that would com commute, uh, converse with me about it, they were actually very scientific and good people trying to be ethical. Like, I mean, obviously, uh, I mean, I own two cats. I love animals. But um, your, your goal when you're vegan is obviously, okay, let's be ethical to both the world, the animals, people, food, sustainability. And there's so much science out there, whether it's pseudoscience or um, clearly those scientists believe in their pitch. Um, but in general, there's so much out there to support you as a vegan that you, you look kind of at carnivory, almost like it's savagery and it's, um, yeah, selfish, selfish, maybe selfish, evil, savagery. It took me a took me a long time to come to terms with the fact that I am, you know, technically quite savage by nature, by design. Like I look at Mother Nature as God. So, um, yeah, it, it's yeah. almost like I have to look into nature for the indications of health as well. Yeah, and I think like what what you said like resonated with me in the sense that like when you look at it that way, you 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 essentially you just look at the biology of things and like, well, where do humans fit in the food chain? And it's like we've done a very phenomenal job of kind of removing ourselves and our minds from that uh, with just inventions and things, but in reality, we still fit in there somewhere. So like. I do wonder, like, when you get to these, like, situations that are, you're, you're kind of changing your place in there, and, and I, I, I suppose the vegan counterpoint to that would be, like, well, technology is allowing us to now move from, you know, our past into one of just plant consumption, and, uh, you know, if that's the case, I haven't seen it yet, <laughs> it's, but uh, it is interesting when you kind of go back to just the biology of it all and, and start to kind of unpack that instead of looking at it as like all one or all the other, it's like, well, w what have we done and what has worked versus, you know, what are we trying to, how far removed do we actually want to get before we step back within kind of the context of the whole, the whole picture? Let me just interject. You know, I think, uh, like you, I don't necessarily think that many people go into a vegan diet for, you know, believing it's the wrong thing to do. I don't think they are, you know, doing necessarily the wrong thing by what they, what they think, but I think they're just misguided. I think there's a lot of misinformation out there. Unfortunately, our nutrition, you know, when it comes to health, and I think there's different topics, we can talk about health environment and ethics, but I mean, when it comes to human health, our nutrition knowledge is, is very incomplete and it's dependent upon very poor methodology, namely observational studies, which really are very confusing and they're very subject to bias and confounding and all those things. And so we don't have a robust, really good handle on what, you know, what is the best diet for, for a population uh, to say nothing of, of, of the individual, you know, an individual certainly is going to thrive as, as you see. Now I'm curious, um, you know, 20 years as a vegan, that's a long stretch. Many people would say, Hey, that's actually proves that veganism is sustainable long-term. Um, and, you know, as we know, we see many people that, that only last a few months or a year and, and then they, they kind of get sick. And so some of the advantages you have, obviously, if you have access to supplements and, and you know, uh, uh, higher quality foods and, and the ability and maybe, you know, the ability to have somebody help you with your nutrition, that makes it easier to be successful long term. And I'm wondering, um, did you go through phase? I know we've had people on there where they kind of rotate through sort of the doctor approved whole food version and they veer off into raw and, uh, you know, fruitarianism and then fasting. And it, it just seems like people are grasping, you know, they find that they're, they try vegan, you know, they, they, often what we see, and, and I think you're a perfect example of this. We have a guy like William Schufeld is another actor who's same thing, you know, but a little shorter, shorter time frame. you know, he was a uh, three or four years veganism, you know, look good. I mean, if you looked at his picture, you say, Hey man, that guy looks good and healthy. Yeah. Uh, very, very impressive physique. And then, you know, within a few years, he said, I just didn't feel good. And I think some people, despite looking well on the outside, actually see that they're, you know, and they don't, you don't really have a frame of reference to compare it to because you only have one body and you can't just, you know, what, what did I feel like when I'm 25? Is that normal until you make this dramatic shift? But I'm just wondering, did your strategy for as being a vegan change over the years? And then what specific, um, you know, did, at what point you said 10 years in, 
you said, hey, maybe something's not right. But what what compelled you to continue to go for another 10 years before you finally said, let's try something else? Well, I've always been a seeker of truth. And so, I mean, at some point during veganism, I was like, okay, this still doesn't feel optimal. So let me go to the next level. So I went raw vegan. So I stayed raw vegan six years. Like, wouldn't eat a cooked food. Just literally thinking, um, you know, I was being trained by a couple of the raw gurus that are out there. And, um, I mean, I spent money, man. I spent thousands, actually, getting certain coaches to come to my house and, hey, cook for me then, you know? I mean, uh, I mean I'm guilty of wasting money when I was a single young bachelor, you know what I mean? Before I had my wife and kids. I would waste money. I, w- I wouldn't say it was a waste, but I would just spend it traveling the world or paying coaches to cook for me or whatever it was I needed because I was so busy when you're doing soap operas. And um, right now I feel re- strange. Like I've got the shivers. I just went on a walk and it's cold and I'm like shivering here. Um, but um, I was raw vegan for like six years. And I lived in Hawaii even for two years and planted my own food because I wanted to get in touch with horticulture. I wanted to know, okay, if I plant the seed, what it'll be like when I harvest it? How is it going to feel when I eat it? Mm. Fresh food. And I definitely felt very good at that stage, even though I was getting skinnier and skinnier. Like, it's not, it's not the mindset of an athlete at that point. It's kind of like, I felt like I was turning into a hippie, a vegan hippie. And um, I was at peace with it. Like, I was just like, well you know, if this is the most optimal health, then I should be able to still be an athlete. Um, And maybe this lighter body weight will give me, you know, a faster track run, even though my power was disappearing. But I would feel like I would be a lighter power to weight ratio athlete. So maybe this is going to be great. Um, But the further I went, even as I was a raw vegan, six years, I was just, okay, here's, here's a big factor. Being a massage therapist, I work with my hands. Like, I mean, even though I work at an entertainment club, I mostly massage the customers. That's what I do. I went to massage school. So I mostly talk to customers and massage. And I was um, massaging on a, on a particular, it was actually a raw vegan expo. And I was massaging a few of the very high profile raw vegan teachers and i just noticed you know being being so um as a as a trainer for 20 years you know you do those pinch tests i mean i know you're a physician so you're at a different higher level but you know you you do those pinch tests on people to, to test body fat as a massage therapist i'm always feeling out a human being's life force like what is that human's tensile resistance like what is their stress level like what is their skin like? Um, I mean, I'm, I pick up on all these little nuances. And that was what, when I was uh, at the Royal Vegan Expo, I was like, these guys feel like they're weak, like to the touch. Like I've been around athletes, been around dancers, and I've been around a uh, you know, variety of people eating. I, mean, I observe people like yourself who are clearly breaking records. So I know the difference when when it comes to physicality and and that, that physicality is a big thing when it comes to what a person eats. So as I massage a person, I'll also ask them, so what is your favorite food? And and what do you eat? Because you're very strong. Like you're different to the typical massage client. And, and, And I know that that's not technically like a credible widespread study, but it was my own personal study. Just like you decided to jump into uh, being a carnivore and looking at that Joe Anderson cat who's been doing it for, you know, 40 years or something. It may not be widespread yet, but to me, there's people like yourself or Ken Berry who have just changed their lives around being carnivore. That's quite a lot of powerful evidence, you know. Jordan Peterson, his daughter, the way they appear physically to have improved dramatically 
So when you're around raw vegans and then they feel really soft to the touch, and I was getting soft to the touch myself, that's when you start feeling like, okay, um, I've, I'm hanging in there, but am I hanging in there for the right reasons? You know, I'm hanging in there, but should I be hanging in there? And once I had my sons, and I'm looking at the well, well, as a father, I don't want to put them into a place where they're deficient. So I need to be true. It's a tough battle to jump out of veganism when you've been doing it for so long. It's like a psychological battle within yourself, you know. But uh, I'd say being a dad pushed me to be responsible and just say, I've got to feel. And if I feel more like I'm getting my sons on, because they're you know, they were infants at the time. And uh, I'd say that was a huge driving force. And I think at first my wife thought I was a little crazy, but, you know, that's that's what they do. They look at you like you're extreme or you're, uh, you know, you're following Sean Baker. Yeah, he, he's, he looks crazy too, just like you. <laughs> but I mean, <laughs> slowly, slowly they, uh, they come around and I just started to like put the uh, animal products in the refrigerator and um, and I just saw them thrive. I saw my wife's health get stronger and leaner, and my children just seemed to uh, thrive cognitively and look stronger. So it was. It felt like okay, I'm on the right path now. Now for a word from our sponsors. All right, folks. This episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast is brought to you by ButcherBox. ButcherBox offers you convenience by delivering your meat right to your door with free shipping. They also offer quality by having options such as 100% grass-fed and grass-finished beef, heritage breed pork, and free-range chicken. They also offer value with their goal to make clean meat accessible to as many people as possible by partnering with a collective of small farms. They are able to deliver you the best products for less than $6 per meal. They often run promos on their website for subscribers to get things like free pork or free bacon. If you enter promo code HPO at checkout, you can also knock an additional $20 off your first subscription. So head over to ButcherBox.com and place your first order. Now, back to the show. I think that's a great... uh... You know, it's a great transition. I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a very illustrative point when you take somebody that's gone on a fully plant-based diet and then you add a significant amount of meat into the diet and the results are pretty striking as to what it does beneficially. And I know that, that, that folks in the, you know, that are they're entrenched in the vegan community would, would disagree strongly and they don't believe it, but then they experience themselves after a period of time. And it does seem to have an important role beyond just you know, saying that if you're on a vegan diet and you take the right supplements and you balance these amino acids and you take, you know, food from all over the world, because really to do a vegan diet adequately, you really need to get products from basically all over over the world. You know, if you're going to do it from whole food, you know, foods that don't grow locally in the same area. And then, and then obviously adequate supplementation to have a chance of doing, doing well over time. And then, and obviously as an athlete, you're going to need to take various protein powders, you know, pea protein isolates and soy isolates and, what not to get in, get to get to get enough protein, you know? Because I know you just can't. The, the amount of volume you need to eat in beans and broccoli and and stuff like that is is pretty high, uh, given its bioavailability and and, and amino acid pro, you know relative ratios makes it challenging. So most most people that are physique athletes or athletes that are pursuing a vegan diet tend to do a lot of supplementation, particularly you know around protein. At least that's been my my observation. Maybe maybe you have a different story with that, but. Uh, what, um, you know, since you switched, and I don't know how long it's been, a couple, you know, at least several months now, what, what are the things that have surprised you? Or, or, or you know, because as we get older, you're 40, you said you're about 45, I'm 52 now. There are things that you notice, uh, what you kind of take them for granted as normal aging. And then when I found when I switched diet, those things went away and I was very surprised. Anything surprise you so far? Um. I mean, massive change in terms of, um, you know, digestion, 
um, the ability to stay lean. I mean, before, I'm a warrior in the sense that, um, I mean, I got a very high pain tolerance, you know. Um, I can, I can get in a fight and get punched crazy. Like, I mean, when I won, even as a youngster, as a champion, I, I think <laughs> the guy beat the heck out of me with punches, but I outpointed him with leg kicks. Um, and so my, my ability to take punishment is high. I think that's why I was able to stay vegan so long and just keep blaming myself. Like, ah, I didn't warm up properly. I got injured or I'm overtraining. You know, I'm as an athlete, you're, you're, you're always having to push your body to the, to the threshold and the limits. Um, I would say that to answer your question accurately in terms of change, I mean, like, I became so much leaner, like all muscle versus before I would, I would probably go out for a hike for like two hours to get like two, three hours and weight train. And, and I also do intermittent fasting. So I'd starve to get lean. So I started noticing, okay, I can eat a lot of calories and, um, and feel stronger and have far less wasted time with excessive workout to get lean. And so it's almost like your metabolism is shifted into a space where you suddenly just feel like, okay, this nutrition is just pure nutrition. It's just fueling my muscles. It's not putting excessive fat or excessive energy or fluff on my physique um, the way it was when I was vegan. Um, forgive me for kind of having shivers. I think I'm just like freezing from a hike and I came straight in and I'm sweating. Because <laughs> I feel like I'm like waking out here talking to you guys. I'm like, why is my body shivering? But um, I was hiking before I prior to this. Came in and I'm kind of cold. Um, say like physique wise, blanket on me. So, um, so everything that was falling apart has began to get re glued back together. Um, there's something I researched on, I think it was Thomas DeLauer. He was talking about the intracellular matrix where all of the collagen holds every tissue together, every single filament of white or of, of red meat in our bodies is also held together, bound by a, you know, a, a matrix of collagen. So it was almost like I was feeling that rebuild itself within myself. And cognitively, I was just like, wow, I'm so much better at, like, at my job or uh, being productive cognitively, I would get up and I'd be like, okay. Because I definitely noticed my testosterone levels, my drive, everything went way up. And um, it just made me a better earner for my family. I mean, now that I am a dad and, uh, you know, faithful husband, <laughs> why she's over there. Um, <laughs> it's like, it's a, it's, it's a different mindset where when I was young, obviously it was like selfishness. I'm just picking the credit card. You're off. Okay, bye. Um, so it's a different mindset and the meat for me, having a steak, it kind of makes me feel like it's a throwback to the great old men that built America in the sense that if you really got to do a lot of physical work, because my job is extremely physical. I mean, I hang from the ceiling in the nightclub. You know, you probably are not going to see this side because you gentlemen are not gay men. You know what I mean? But like, it's like a Cirque du Soleil Zumatic show. You know what I'm saying? Um, and so you're, you're having to, in my job, uh, you're having to also be very physical as a sort of peacock in order to attract your money. And that goes for whether you're modeling or acting and you're the, the hot boy in the show for the day to being an entertainer in the club. Um, 
and you're dealing with, I'm dealing with a lot of other dancers or athletes or individuals that are also taking steroids when I'm not. So to be in an environment, and I'm pretty sure Sean knows what that's like, to be in an environment when you're around steroid users and you're not a steroid user, it's kind of like, okay, like you can compete with them, but being a vegan and trying to compete, I was at such a disadvantage. It was crazy. It was like, um, not only psychologically was it a constant battle, I think my spirit was able to stay strong through it, but um, lower testosterone levels, clearly lower collagen levels, injuries, and I put on a brave face. So um, just like right now, I'm shivering and doing this interview. I don't even know why I'm shivering really because of the, but other than just, I probably exposed myself to cold, but I'll just soldier on. And I would soldier on at work. So if I had to swing from the ceiling, vegan, injured, no one would know I was injured. You know, I would just avoid that area of my body and just fight on. That's just how I've been raised to be. And so it's kind of comforting now hitting 45. And I'm like, oh, man, I'm beginning to feel 25 again, like from internally. And, you know, for your audience sake, let's let's just... Like, I'm always that lean. You know what I'm saying? So people don't people don't tend to look at me and go, oh, that guy's suffering. And I don't look like I'm suffering. And I didn't really look like I was suffering vegan either. So you're putting on a brave face. But internally, I was suffering. So coming back to eating the meat, and the, obviously watching Sean eat masses of amount of meat, starts to give you confidence of, oh, so first of all, he's not dying. He's not having a heart attack. He's, he's going up against all this psychological negativity of the mainstream and the vegans that are extreme attacking him. And yet he's breaking world records. I'm like, I want to break a world record. So he's actually quite the pioneer, a tra trailblazer, I'd say. And uh, well, that, that's a compliment to you, Sean, even though I, I don't see you on the screen right now. But, um, those, those were certain factors that were hugely influential for me to say, okay, I'm going to start trying the steak. And the more I tried the steak, the more I was like, okay, I'm feeling stronger, I'm feeling more testosterone. I'm feeling my injuries heal. I mean, it's, it's, it feels like it's a, um, I don't know, it's like a, a lighthouse. Did you did you get any before and after blood work to see if you had like a change in testosterone or anything like that when you switched or? You know, my thing is I'm very skeptical of that too. I'm skeptical of all the blood work measurements. And I mean, I saw one podcast where Sean was getting, you know, I guess uh, maybe it, the word is ridicule about blood work. But I was like, well, who knows what the blood is supposed to be like anyway? You know, like if you check the blood of a, a dog, a wolf, or a crocodile, what is that going to look like? Um, and being interested in longevity, it, it's not just a sort of fleeting vanity thing. It's like, I want longevity so I can achieve. I want longevity so I can be a grandfather, so I can raise my sons, so I can, you know, achieve more Sean kind of brave the whole well maybe the blood work thing isn't as relative irrelevant because it's go go on how you feel and a crocodile that's a pure meat eater living to be 300 years it's just like well there's something to this you know I do think that fasting with the meat because obviously if you look at a crocodile they they'll crawl under the river and can fast for an entire year. So there's definitely something to the fasting, extending our lifespan. Um, obviously, you can't, we can't go on record and, and say we know for sure that lifespan will be extended. But, um, you know, looking at someone like Sean in his 50s kind of looks like he's 30, quite frankly. So that, to me, was a huge biomarker uh, towards why uh, this may be the longevity 
pathway. I mean, I still think that blueberries or yogurt may be a intelligent thing to keep in there. I don't know yet based upon what the latest science data shows on the positives or negatives of those, you know, plant chemicals or plant toxins, lectin, so to speak. But um, I was interested in Sean's journey because he actually, even though doesn't necessarily believe in longevitarian uh, research, well, I saw one of his podcasts, he did, you don't necessarily believe in it, but you look like a biohacker yourself, you know. You, let, you, me, let, me, let me just respond to a couple of things. You know, it's not that I don't value blood, you know, work in, in certain situations. It's just that so many of the reference values are, are based on a standard American diet, grain-based diet, so we don't really know what the, the actual reference ranges are for people that don't follow that. And then they're often very dynamic and that you have to put in that in context of what's going on clinically. And so, so many people, there are so many people that are very sick you know, you, I mean, you can just look at them and see that they're, you know, 70, 80 pounds overweight and their knees hurt and, and they can have stellar labs. I mean, they can have, you know, quote unquote, perfect LDL numbers if we want to believe what the LDL ranges say. And the same thing with all these things. So I, I don't dismiss it completely out of hand. It's just that it's more nuanced than what we think it is. Um, as far as uh, longevity, um, you know, obviously we want to live long, but more importantly, we want to live long with a good quality of life. I mean, it's no, it, you know, you, you, if you can eke it out to a hundred, but you spend 20 years, you know, in a wheelchair or very frail or dependent, then that's really, I mean, I don't know if you've achieved much. And I think the problem I have with the people that are longevity research, it's not that I'm opposed to that. It's just that, uh, you know, the proof ends up being in the pudding and until you can start producing people living to 120 plus years in good health, uh, then I'm very skeptical because I think it's all just uh, high, high, high level speculation and it's based on mice and rats and nematodes. And until we start getting human data that supports what they're saying, I don't hold, you know, I don't hold them in that much uh, regard. Uh, it's not that I, I don't think they're doing valuable work, but I, I think trying to proclaim that you have the answer when you don't have the answer, you might have the answer in nematodes or frogs, but you don't have the answer in human beings. That's what I'm most concerned with. And I think when we look at what the data we have in humans right now, uh, you know, there's no real consistent, clear pattern that we can say that uh, what's going to make you live long. You know, whenever you interview these super centenarians, I mean, one will say I ate a cookie a day. One will say I ate bacon and eggs every day. One will say <laughs> a glass of wine every day. So there's no real consistent pattern there. And it, it may just be all down to genetics and some of that stuff. So we were a long ways from, you know, and I, you know, and I, like I said, every decade there's a new new longevity guru that's out there, and they get a big following. And you know, they don't offer a money back guarantee. I mean, it's not like you know, if you don't live to a hundred, you'll get your money back type of thing. That just doesn't happen. So it's a very it's a very uh, easy place to be, I suppose, because you can you can basically say whatever you want, and you know, back it up with whatever science you want, and people can believe it and buy it buy buy into it and send you their hard-earned savings to 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 think they're going to live to to 120 but there's there's no results at this point yeah i can agree with uh that up to the point where i'm like well you know i've got a sort of a, a vested interest in my own biohacking company that i'm starting to push where I look at all the factors. Like to me, you look like a longevitarian. I, I mean, I think that as I started at first, I just thought, okay, this guy's a crazy tycoon. He's like eating, he's eating burgers out of a fast food joint. I'm going to watch him, you know, <laughs> but, um, because I, you know, I didn't necessarily associate that with high quality food at the time until I started doing more and more research on what it was you were saying. But, um, you being, you know, 52 and breaking a world record in the rowing, it was like, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to tune in some more to this guy because then I saw your video of your dad. I'm like, okay, your dad looked jacked. He's running down the beach. So I was just like, okay, that's longevitarianism to me. So, like, for instance, just 
adding in creatine or adding in resveratrol or adding in um, nettle tea or toncat ali. I, I mean, I do supplement with those types of uh, you know, natural libido boosters, which whether they're proven to be test boosters, I do feel that those things do bring me, you know, extra well-being or extra blood flow. So I would say that there are different ingredients out there, including steak, as you have shown, that seem to be percentage factors in at least increasing quality of life, strength of life, life force. I feel if you can increase life force and strength and your numbers in the gym, then that's a great indicator, as you just said, like, yeah, the proof is in the pudding. Well, you know, you have shown yourself to be pudding. I mean, <clears throat> as a man who I often have to mentor some of the younger dancers that come into the business. And I've danced, you know, the biggest straight um, clubs too, whether it's been La Bear or Hollywood Men, I was like sort of the front guy. And uh, having to mentor some of the other dudes as to how to do the job like, you know, it's like being a Chippendale. Um, when I uh, when I analyze you, even from a, a straight man perspective, I'd be like, well, that guy would make money. That guy would like, <laughs> I mean, you're Dr. Sean Baker, but it's, it's of my job is that your physical prowess is what makes you the money. You know what I mean? So my eye naturally tunes in like, okay, it's kind of interesting that a guy who's 52 and breaking world records looks like he could step on the stage with all the alpha males and make a ton of money. Like that, to me, is a factor that drew me to studying you that made me go, okay, well, he's part of my repertoire in the sense that, I mean, I do study Dr. David Sinclair. I do study um, Thomas DeLauer. I study Dr. Berg, Dr. Camberry. I mean, I'll even study Stephen Guntry. Dr. Stephen Guntry, even though he doesn't look, he doesn't have the, the physical prowess that makes me go, okay, you know, it is what he's advising, you know, tons of olive oil. Is that really the route? I mean, uh, it doesn't look like it. And then there are other researchers that would say that that's the worst thing you could do for your health. So for me, you know, let's say you'd look at someone like a Dr. Stephen Guntry who might he put out the plant paradox, I believe. So he's become a number one New York bestseller and he's on all the shows. Uh, he was formerly a heart surgeon, but he physically doesn't appear to have the type of strength or life force that you do. He may be 10 years your senior. I don't know. But those are the things I'm always analyzing. Like who actually has the pudding? Who is the proof? Who is the pudding? So in compliment to you, you could step on a stage where I work and probably just make a killing. Uh, not that you want to do that, but that's a factor that, <laughs> that's a factor that, you know, always plays in my mind. Like, could that guy, you know, lead an army? Could he be the Leonidas? Because at the end of the day, you know, when I'm at work, uh, the owner of the club pays me well so that I can, keep the boys motivated, uh, following the rules, you know. And in order to do that, I have to be somewhat of a Leonidas figure myself. I have to, you know, it's, it's an environment where people are going to have a good time and party and drink and they, you know, they're going to act up. But I don't drink, you know, occasional red wine. But my job is to make sure that the party runs smoothly and that people are happy and entertained and, and get, get home safely and cabs and whatnot and don't drink and drive. So... Yeah, I think too, like some of the stuff that, that you touched on and what Sean mentioned too, is like, they're kind of pieces to the puzzle where when you can kind of have them all line up to a degree, you, you can, you can start to see like what your optimum health is. And like with, well, for like the blood test, for example, it's like, you know, you have this one snapshot, so it might not tell you something right out the gate. Uh, and then there's a lot of context there too. Like, were you fasted before? Did you do a workout right before it? Did you eat a meal right before? And that sort of stuff. But like, if, 
you can maybe see trends where if you're real consistent about when and how you get those done, you can see like, well, this is going up or this is going down. Uh, and that can maybe be helpful, but then, you know, you pair that stuff also with kind of that physical appearance as well as how you feel individually can be that another piece of that puzzle to kind of use to guide you. So like, you know, if I'm feeling really miserable and then I go and get the blood test and it shows that like my vitamin B12 is really, really low, you know, those are two things I can work kind of together to kind of pinpoint maybe what I'm doing wrong or what I can maybe do to maybe improve that. Yeah. Well, I guess uh, maybe I should, you know, venture into blood testing at some point. It's not been something I've always gone based upon feeling. I guess I've had such a distrust of the medical system in it, in its entirety that, thank God, knock on wood, I haven't had any issue to put me in a position where I couldn't just, you know, fix it myself. Um, and I guess there was another doctor named Dr. Joel Wallach, who I study a lot and he goes, I mean, he has a company called Yongevity, which is supplement based. And he, he obviously wants to live long and puts out about a lot of those type of supplements too, for anti-aging. But, um, he promotes steak and eggs, just like, uh, you know, Sean and Vince Garanda. So I was like, okay. There's Sean Baker, there's Vince Garanda, there's Dr. Joel Wallach. And Dr. Joel Wallach speaks about the fact that, you know, the medical industry kills about 100,000 people a year, misdiagnosis and whatnot, and, um, uh, you know, certain infections happening in hospitals and whatnot. So, you know, that whole thing just kind of has me on like, whoa, you know, like I'd much rather go a homeopathic dietary uh, pathway and, and take good care of myself than end up, you know, the victim of that system. So I guess that's been my reason for being gun shy at going and getting the blood test, but maybe I shouldn't, you know, I, I did recently get a bunch of exosomes injected into my Achilles tendons and knees so that they could repair, uh, it cost me so far like $7,000, but I feel like, you know, it was an, a good investment for me because I mean, I'm, I jumped on, I just managed to get onto a box that was 58 inches high and managed to run the four six with sore Achilles tendons. So I'm like, okay, if I get my Achilles tendons to finally just feel like I can train without them getting sore, I'll stick to like steak and eggs a lot. Then maybe I can finally get back below that four, four, 10, three, and finally like take my place on, on the athletic stage that I've always wanted to do. Like it was, it was always a dream of mine to like fulfill an athletic miracle, you know, whether it's a world record and just inspire people like, look, this is the truth, people. I mean, if I look at what Sean has done for me as a, uh, I'm, I'm obviously, I'm seven years younger. He's uh, trailblazing a path where by him doing all the steak and eggs and breaking records and being as strong as he is, in, in many ways, I want to do that too. So I'll be able to like pull off this record and then bring more traffic to someone like Sean Baker because he is a doctor. So he holds more credibility than I do in the nutritional, I'd say in the nutritional pathway, people will be like, well, you know, who is Dr. Sean Baker? So it, it for me is a way of helping people. Um, you know, sometimes when we do these egotistical feats, people are just like, oh, it's all ego. It's all about yourself. But, you know, the, the accomplishing things is a beacon of hope for others. So by Sean accomplishing what he has accomplished, that's a beacon of hope for me. If I can accomplish what I want to accomplish, I can put out a beacon of hope for others. You know, like one of the main reasons I wanted to do this with Sean is because whenever I'm, you know, out and about talking about what I'm doing, people are always asking me, Oh my God, you got the perfect body. What are you doing? I'm like, well, I'm, I'm sort of trying this, you know, carnivore thing, a lot of steak and a lot of eggs. And people look at you like, are you crazy? You're going to have a heart attack. And I'm like, no, you should study Dr. Sean Baker. And they're like, who's that? And I'm like, so, you know, in some ways, although you may, 
have got a lot of people following you from the uh, Joe Rogan podcast and whatnot. And other, I don't know what other else. I think I was first introduced to seeing you on Joe Rogan. Either that or I saw that documentary of you eating, uh, you know, Sean was eating a, a ton of burgers. And uh, that was the part that sort of triggered my curiosity. But the the thing I want to do is introduce my audience, the people who followed me from entertaining, acting, whatnot, to Sean Baker, because it's like, okay, here's a man who's older than Marcus. Here's a man who's achieving world records. Here's a man who's served in the war and, and also, uh, you know, a doctor. So oh, osteopathy, is that correct? Osteopath. So, no, orthopedics, I'm an allopathic, you know, regular MD, but it's orthopedic surgery. But, uh, okay. I'm just... Uh, <laughs> I'm I'm very happy to 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 know that I have a potential career as a male dancer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's something I'll ever do. But uh, yeah. anyway, I appreciate that that insight. <laughs> kind of yeah. makes me laugh. Um, yeah. I think you know your point about you know doing something and demonstrating what you can do is important. I think it. it I mean, I wouldn't under I wouldn't sell myself short. I mean, if you can do brick world record like Zach has done, and you know some of the stuff I've done. Uh, does inspire a lot of people and it does change the conversation and I think it's uh, it's very important to do those things very important to, to get the story out there I want to ask you since you've been doing this you know crazy car, near carnivorous or carnivorous style diet yeah are you finding people that you work with day to day some of the other people that work with you perhaps in dancing or some of the other entertainment yeah. stuff are they receptive to that? Are you getting a lot of backlash because you're you're a relatively popular figure? You've got a large following. When you talk about this, do you get do you get any negativity thrown your way, knowing that you were a, a long time advocate and, and proponent of, of plant based diets? Yeah, I mean, I'm a kind of dichotomy in the sense that I'm I'm extremely scientific and extremely spiritual. I was raised by my mom, who's very Christian. And she had me all up in the church from like nine to five every day. And like my summer school was all in church. So I was raised to try to be like Jesus, you know, like that's how my mother wanted me to, to, to grow. And there's some good, there's some very good sides to, to that part of my upbringing. And my father, on the other hand, is very, he was British agnostic. He has a master's degree in physics, karate teacher, very stoic um, and doesn't really believe in God per se, other than it being a force of nature. So when people come at me with a very hard tone, it will trigger the fighter in me. You know, it's not that I, I don't, I, I do my best to be tolerant and patient of people, but at the same time, like, if people are negative towards me, I, I kind of just cut them out of my life. I, I've, I've had situations where people who were very loving and friendly towards me when I was vegan, all of a sudden just don't want to be your friend. And I'm just like, well, that's kind of weird. Because even when I was vegan, like, my whole family ate meat. Um, you know, I never cut people off because of their nutrition. Um, so I started to notice that there, there definitely is some form of... Uh, as a negative cultish way that comes about in the vegan community. And I didn't really want to be a part of that. I wanted to be a part of the health movement and um, being a mediator as, as you, your question is at, at my club. No, more than likely those people tend to eat a lot of fast food, drink and smoke a lot. They're some of the nicest people in the world but they kind of live like that YOLO lifestyle. You call it, you, you only live once. Um, and so their, their take on it would be like, oh yeah, that's great, you're eating meat now, you know, you should. Um, at the same time, they'll be like, but you don't, go, you don't have to go that extreme, you know? I'm like, well, my goals are a little different to yours, you know? Uh, chasing excellence means that I want to find out what nutrition is excellence. So, um, you know, I probably subscribe to eating like steak and eggs like you do five days of the week. And then two days of those of the week, I'll eat quite a bit of salad and some fruit. 
or I'll treat myself if I'm out with date night on, with the wifey and have like a, a fed burger, you know what I mean, with the bread, which I know is not optimal, but it kind of takes the psychological edge off for me from just living on steak and eggs almost daily. Um, but I, I'm taking note of my body and taking note when I observe you and a few others like Dr. Ken Berry or Tom Stilauer. I take note of how physically superior one tends to feel when eating steak and eggs. And, um, you know, then I study, I'll, I'll study Vince Garanda videos to be like, okay, so all these guys that were like bodybuilders pre, pre-steroid era were also eating steak and eggs. So, I mean, I pay attention to everything, you know, I just... I look at this journey we call life as a gift. And um, in, on my spiritual side, I'd consider myself a theologian, which is different to, you know, the typical religious person. I'm more scientific about my analyzing of scriptures. I mean, I went as far as go to, I went to Jerusalem. I went into pyramids. I went hunting for answers. I mean, you know, to me, I'd like to find out where, ancient scriptures and science converge. So, you know, the Methuselah theme from the ancient scriptures has been fascinating to me. Uh, So that's why when Methuselah Mouse came about from Dr. David Sinclair's research, Harvard University, I was like, okay, this could be credible. So I, I don't, you know, negate the fact that yes, we have no human data. We have, we only have the lab rats, the Methuselah Mouse, but I, still look at it like well if you can extend a a mouse's lifespan nine times there's a pretty good chance that a human could do it we haven't done it yet but um i like the words hope faith positivity um and i like those words even though those words are definitely scripture based type words i like those words because without hope without faith without positivity you, you can never get your goals achieved. So for me, I'll take those words and apply them to, alongside the science of longevity, you know. And I, I look at it like this. I take a leaf out of everybody's book that seems to be on the right path. So I'll take a leaf from you. I'll, I do supplement res, with resveratrol because that has been shown to be excellent at being anti-cancerous. And... Um, you know, I do make sure I have my, my butter that's grass fed or higher fats. I, I just, I'm trying to find a way because I just obviously finished writing a book and I believe I put your name in that book. Um, yeah. And that's soon to come out and it's just trying to find the most optimal way for us human beings to, to live on planet earth. I mean, before we attempt to be the saviors of the animals. We've got to be the saviors of ourselves. We as a human species are so screwed up, you know, um, that to me, yeah, it's like, I felt like I probably was overstretching myself as a vegan. Psychologically, my mindset was help everybody, you know, help everybody else, help the animals. I, was run- I think I, might, I was becoming like very spacey, <laughs> like helping everybody but not necessarily helping myself and then having a wife and kids, it, it grounded me. It's forced me to be so grounded that I was like, okay, I have to just like this little kitty right here, just jump me. I have to get myself strong in nature. And then I have to nurture my babies and, and pr- protect and provide and feed. So, Now for a word from our sponsors. This episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast is brought to you by X3 Bar. The X3 Bar puts a new spin on banded workouts. Historically, bands have been supplementary or inadequate for true heavy lifting. Dr. Jakish has brought a product to market that has the convenience of bands, but with the option to provide the resistance of heavy free weights. The X3 bar has four custom bands, with the thickest one being engineered to sport over 500 pounds of resistance. The bar is designed to rotate as you move through the full range of motion. 
All this is anchored to the ground on a small standing plank. The design allows progressive resistance throughout the lift, which more evenly distributes the lift's difficulty through the full range of motion. Personally, I've been using this both at home and when traveling on the road. It fits nicely into a rolling duffel and takes just a few seconds to set up. Sean has been using it for both core lifts and supplementary lifts. Dr. Jakish includes a training plan along with a detailed description of how to use the X3 bar for quick full body workouts. For a deep dive into the science, check out our episode 131 with Dr. Jakish. He also has loads of information on his website, which is x3bar.com. That's the letter X number three bar.com. If interested in purchasing an X3 bar, take advantage of our promo code 50X3 for $50 off your purchase. Link and code can be found in the show notes. Now back to the show. I think that's a really good uh, sentiment about saving yourself or the humans before we have to save the other animals. I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's a very important concept. And, you know, just, to, just from an environmental impact, you know, we know that the uh, healthcare sector is about 10% of our greenhouse gas emissions if we want to, you know, talk in that language. Whereas, you know, animal agriculture, particularly cows, you know, are 2% and animal agriculture is 4 And so and we have to say, well, you know, would you rather contribute to something that produces 2% of our problem or something that produces 10% of our problem? So I think getting healthy, staying out of the healthcare system, you know, is, is, is the best thing you can do for the environment, quite honestly. Uh, and whether that's achieved through a carnivore diet or a vegan diet or whatever, uh, you know, getting healthy is going to have the biggest impact on what you can do individually. And some people say the biggest, you know, the vegan activists to say the biggest single thing you can do is give up meat. And I would argue the biggest single thing you can do is get healthy. And I think that's a, that's a more powerful uh, way to look at things. And whatever, whatever allows you to get healthy is going to ultimately, you know, and what's sustainable for you. And, you know, like you said, you've, for your own mind, you've sort of found that the plant-based uh, strategy was lacking in the end and it, and it showed. And like I said, as we see uh, the, the nice thing about, you know, with athletes, particularly high level athletes, and we're seeing this time and time again, uh, when they're, they put their body under significant stress with what they do, particularly depending on the sport, they find that the vegan diet is very much wanting. And despite the uh, James Cameron, Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, Novak Djokovic, and and, and uh, who was the other one? Jackie Chan, I think. Production, you know, this game changer thing where they're trying to make the case that you don't need need to be successful as an athlete. I think the athletes themselves are painting a very different picture. You know, we see with Cam Newton and Kyrie Irving, and uh, you know, Demarcus Cousins, and you know, the you know the, the list just goes on and on and on. All these athletes that try it, they get hurt, they stay hurt, they can't recover the performance declines and then they end up retiring. And so, uh, you know, I think, you know, people like yourself who are obviously um, genetically gifted, and I think that's fair to say, uh, you know, we see people in the NFL that, I mean, they, they eat a junk food diet. I mean, they live on McDonald's and yet they have very impressive physiques and are very impressive athletes. And so it yeah. shows the adaptability of the human, human being. And so, when those guys give up the French fries and the Coca-Colas and they say go on a plant-based diet, they notice an improvement for a short period of time. And then they tend to find that they're, they're, they're lacking certain nutrition nutrients and uh, they tend to crash. And so, um, but I mean, hats off for you for making it work as long as you did for 20 years. I mean, I think most people would have, uh, you know, wouldn't have lasted that long. So you've got something special there as far as tenacity and discipline and, you know, intelligence enough to make whatever you're doing work. Now, I'm glad you found something that's easier because I think a carnivore diet is about the easiest damn diet on the world. I mean, you don't have yeah. to think about it, really. You just eat. And I would say that, you know, I know you made the analogy of the crocodiles living a long time. I think the average crocodile lives 70 to 100 years or something like that. So they're pretty long-lived species. And yes, they're carnivorous. And yes, they intermittent fast. They don't, sometimes they'll go months, even up to a year between meals, which is kind of, kind of amazing. But uh, we're seeing that... Uh, you know, the results at the end of the day are what's really driving this thing. And, and hopefully more will come out and more will come forward. And uh, it's nice to have that. I mean, we see a big push from the entertainment industry. People are being giving a lot of money from to, to shill, you know, the fake meat. You know, we see these beyond meat. These athletes are getting paid, obviously, by these companies to, to prop their products up. And uh, that, unfortunately, 
impacts people. I mean, you know, the celebrity endorsement has a huge role. That's why they get paid to do this. And so hopefully more mm-hmm. celebrities will come out and say, hey, let's just eat real food. Let's stop eating these fake products. Let's stop drinking the Pepsi and the Coca-Cola and the, the processed food, whatever it is, whether it's a fake meat burger or some kind of, you know, Doritos or something like that. Because I know the money is good and sometimes people will do a lot of things for money. But, you know, I think mm-hmm. there's equally, I think there's a lot of benefit in, in, in doing the right thing and uh, inspiring people to do the to, to improve their lives. Maybe you could touch on for my audience, uh, two things that come to mind. Number one, I don't really know anything about Zach, which would be nice to for, for my audience to know about Zach. And then for you, um, like, I guess from my audience's point of view, they probably never heard of somebody who lives on steak and eggs or just steak. And, um, and then, you know, even from my own curiosity point of view, like, um, like the elimination of complete vegetation or, or a salad or, or, or even fruit, is that truly what you live on and, and you thrive that way? Yeah, let me, I'm going to, just because Zach is pretty modest, but Zach is a monster runner. I mean, he's a world record holder for 100 miles, both on trail and on the track. He's run 100 miles in 11 hours and I think 19 minutes on the track. Uh, I mean, smashed the latest world record. He just did this this year. And Zach pursues a largely a low-carbohydrate diet. He does dabble into carnivory for recovery, and but uses, uses a little bit of targeted carbohydrates during performance and, and around peaking. But he is, you know, like I said, he is by far, you know, one of the more impressive runners on the planet when it comes to long distances. I mean, I think he was 100 miles averaging a 647 pace, which is mind-boggling. I think you can run a 647 mile and do it 100 times in a row, which is, which is just... Yeah, that's crazy. So is that... Is 100 that, miles. I can let you add to that <laughs> if you want. Yeah, it's, you, you, you end up running 100 miles. You don't plan to do that. <laughs> but yeah, I, I do a lot of ultra marathon type stuff and I got into kind of uh, one of a form of a high fat, low carb diet about eight years ago. So I've kind of used that as kind of my nutrition piece uh, for the majority of my ultra marathon running career. And I like to call it kind of a periodized approach. So like, like Sean kind of mentioned, there's parts of the year where I'm kind of more focusing on recovery where I'll drop the carbs down next to nothing. Uh, there'll be other points where I'm doing like really big training blocks where I might be running and doing some strength and mobility stuff like 20 ish hours a week. So those, those times I'll let the carbs come back a little bit, but still at a, a what would be considered a high fat, low carb amount. Um, yeah, that's just kind of what I found works well for me. You know, I focus on high quality bioavailable protein sources, like animal, animal protein sources, uh, I like, uh, I like to try to do creative stuff, I guess, with the vegetables I eat and things like that, whether it be like fermenting or cooking it appropriately and things like that. I think that's kind of an interesting way to kind of prepare food. Uh, but yeah, that's kind of, kind of my jam. So just to confirm, you're, you're able to run this 100-mile marathon on carnivory, pure carnivory, or do you, do you have to like Thick carbohydrates like most yeah of mm-hmm. yeah i do it's uh yeah i don't do like a strict i'm not like sean where it's just kind of steak water and salt mostly i i do have a, quite a bit of animal products in my diet but during racing i'll be taking in carbohydrates but it's typically quite a bit lower than what most people are doing that are following kind of a high carb diet mm-hmm. yeah and just to come back to your uh question about myself yeah i mean i've gone basically three years without any significant fruit vegetable or any plant material at all in my diet. So it's pretty much all animal based. Uh, it's mostly steak. You know, sometimes I'll add eggs, sometimes seafood, sometimes uh, really a little bit of dairy to that. But uh, I mean, it's, it's generally steak and eggs for me and that's what works well. You know, I think as I get older, the, the, the better that, that turns out for me, I just got, you know, like I said, I just got back from Malaysia and one of the, one of the conference presenters was talking about uh, food sensitivities and they test people with, uh, uh, immunoglobulins and they said they've been doing this for 20 years and they tested something like a quarter of a million people every year for 20 years and they've almost never seen anyone with sensitivities to red meat i mean everybody you know it's it's very it's a very well tolerated food for pretty much almost all humans on the planet based on based on their data so i think it's also kind of goes in line with what we're seeing you know in this community with people 
you know, developing or, or seeing the, 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 rem, the remission of a lot of, a lot of, a lot of, med, a lot of medical issues, whether it's autoimmune diseases, gastrointestinal illnesses, irritable bowel syndrome, you know, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, arthritis, diabetes, obesity, thyroid issues. I mean, the list goes on and on, depression, uh, and so on and so forth. I would, let me ask you a question. Did you, I mean, I don't know if you ever had any issues with uh, depression or mood issues. Did you, did you find a notice a change? I mean, most people, when they go to college, oh, yeah. Side, yeah, they'll say that, uh, well, go ahead and tell me what, you, what your, your experience has been. Well, I'd say <clears throat> my job is, is, is um, I have to be in the middle of hundreds of people and half naked like every night. So it's kind of like being in a bodybuilder show every night in the middle of people who are drinking and people who are bar brawling, fighting, or, um, you know, just getting into like ridiculous behavior sometimes. Uh, and so then you come home from that with all that loud music, you come home to your kids and your kids are crazy when they're infants. Like my, my two baby boys, it just, <laughs> I love them, but they're just like, it's like two chimpanzees, you know? So I, I would, you've got the pressure of the club. You've got the pressure of family life. When I was vegan, I think the only thing that got me through the anxiety was the fact that I have such a strong will and maybe even my spiritual practice of just constantly being in a state of prayer, meditation and resilience. Um, because when I began to eat the animal products again, it was kind of like coming out of a cloud. I don't know if I've, if I've said this before already, but it was almost like, just like I said, changing from a sheep to a wolf. And I mean, if you look at the, the way a sheep operates, it, you know, it grazes, it looks around. It's very, you know, it's very uh, timid. It follows other sheep, you know. And then a wolf has that, like that, that savvy and that quickness and that alertness and that cognitive, I'm going to get my meal. And I mean, I hate to be quite so blatant about it, but I felt like I was just way better at my job. Like, like it was like night and day. Like all of a sudden I was like, like I'm, I'm here to work and to hunt and to feed and provide, you know? for my family. And I felt that like that savagery that's required for success. I mean, and then that psychologically, yeah, I think as testosterone comes up, your cortisol naturally goes down. So cortisol is going down, testosterone is coming up. Um, at, at certain points I had to watch myself. Like, I'm like, man, I feel like, I feel like fighting, you know? Um, so I have to like, what is this? You know, it's definitely a psychological journey in the sense that you go from being a sheep to being a lion. Like I literally started to feel like, even with my wife, like, like this animalistic, yeah, I want you. You know, before I was more passive. <laughs> and it's like, and so I have to like check myself because eating that meat, is literally like becoming a, a lion versus eating sheep food, you know? Um, I mean, it's, it sounds very simplistic, but I'm pretty sure if you take an animal and I mean, ruminant animals from what I understand are actually not as vegan as we're told they are. Like for the longest time, you know, everyone goes around saying, Oh, well eat like a gorilla. You'll be like a gorilla. But doc, Dr. Joel Wallach, who is, uh, a veterinarian and a um, pathologist done ton tons of autopsies so he had a lot of credibility when he was you know giving this lecture he explains how ruminoid animals digest the grass ferment it and create insects within their self inside their stomachs and and um so they're actually not technically vegan and he, you know being a vet i trust his opinion he says that they digest a form of maggots that they create within their intestinal bowels and it's high fat, high protein and that the grass is not what they're getting their nutrients from. So that was a big light bulb for me. Like, wow. So all this time I'm thinking of munching on greens and I'm becoming a, a strong gorilla 
why isn't it working for me? Um, it's because a gorilla has that big distended gut to be able to chew those greens, ferment them, grow a kind of fungus slash maggot, maggot bacteria inside of the stomach and then digest that. And that's what makes them so powerful. Not to mention, they'll, you know, they'll, they'll stick a stick inside a termite mound, pull that out and eat termites like a shish kebab. So having studied nature, studied, you know, the veterinarians and, and then studied my own body, I was like, yeah, this is night and day. Um, I've changed from a lamb to a, to a wolf and I feel good about it. I, I, there is a, a psychological thing that's like, oh, I wish I could have been a vegan. I really wish I, I, you know, from a point of view of loving animals and not wanting to be savage, I wish I could have stayed a vegan. But the reality of it is when I look at my sons, I, I love my sons so much. I want them to do better than I did. I want them to have a better life than me. I don't want them to, you know, suffer with injuries or not achieve what they want to achieve. I mean, hopefully I can still achieve the world record I want to chase. You know, if I can chip this four, six down, I mean, think about it. If I'm running a four, six and I'm a vegan pulling myself apart, ripped, got Achilles tendons and knee problems, I get that all back on track with this meat and I pull it off. That will really help the world go. Wow. You know, we, we, we do have to eat this, this healthy way. Um, and so that, that's really a goal of mine, you know? Like, I, I, think, I live for that. I think that, uh, you know, regardless, I mean, you know, if, if you're 45 and you're running a, you know, sub 4.5 or 4.440 and legit, that's going to get a lot of people's attention regardless of what, you know, if you get down to, what is it, 4.1 or something like that. Yeah. But I think, you know, the point about the, the ruminant animals, I'm not sure that they convert the vegetables into insects, but I think they, they convert those, they, they, the, 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 the bacteria in their gut ferments those plants and turns them into short chain fatty acids. So they actually, in a sense, are on a high fat diet. And as we know, a gorilla eats 40 to 60 pounds of leaves a day. I mean, that's just not something you and I can do. Uh, same thing with a cow. A cow has a 50 gallon, 50 gallon room. They've got 50 gallons of food that they're, that they have in there at any one time. And so these animals uh, that are big herbivores have a very specialized adapted a digestive tract to allow them to do that. And it is basically through fermentation that they, they, they basically ultimately turn that fiber into actually fat, which is what they're on. And we're getting the fat directly from the animal, which is a much more efficient way of doing this. You know, like people say, you know, like the vegan, like this Patrick Baboumian guy talk about, he's never, he's, he's, he, he's as strong as an ox, but he's never seen an ox eat meat. Well, an ox or a gorilla, I mean, a gorilla eats 40 pounds of food a day. And then they also eat their own feces because you know, they can't get enough nutrition from the first pass through. And so it's kind of like, it's not a very intelligent comparison in my view. Um, let me ask you just an unrelated question because you said you do, you know, your, your main profession right now is doing kind of dancing in clubs and, you know, and it's mostly for men. Is there a reason why you don't, I mean, is it more lucrative to do it in a men's club versus, you know, where there's women or what's, what's, the, what's, um, what's the choice behind that? And that's more my wife holding me hostage. Um, <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, I used to do so well at the women's clubs too, but she met me at the women's clubs and, uh, you know, she knows that, you know, you're having a lap dance in you know, hundreds and hundreds of women. I mean, you get $20 to sit on the woman's lap. You know what I mean? So you just, you try to, your job is to sit on as many laps or <laughs> lap dance. You're not really sitting on their lap, but your job is to get as many of the women to, uh, pick you and give you your 20 and you do your little dance and they touch your muscles. So obviously that being my job and my wife raising babies and, and she was a champion dancer herself. So she's not, she's not a, she's a very shrewd individual. She's savvy. She's very street smart. So she knows that if I was lap dancing for a lot of women that, um, I would be putting myself into a, a line of temptation, you know, um, that she doesn't want to tolerate. And then she also said, you know, how would you like it if, because we made an agreement to kind of go traditional. She homeschools our babies. She takes really good care of them. She feeds them. She, you know, we, we love our, we love parenting. So we, we kind of are traditional. Like I, I, I go out, make the money and she's focused on the home. So, and the babies. So she's like, would you like it if I was out lap dancing, man, while you're at home 
doing the babies? And I was like, no. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, not at all. Um, so, you know, I'd say being honest and uh, keeping my wife happy is the reason why I just said, okay, I'll not work at the female club and just work at the male club. And uh, the interesting thing about working for a male club and being a straight man, and, and, and they all know about me and my family, is they, they actually champion me. They, they champion me like, you know, we, we love you. You know, you're just, we know you're straight. You know, you're a beautiful wife and your kids and you're such a good dad. And you're, you're in better shape than all these other boys. So it's kind of like the beautiful thing about the gay culture is they really champion physicality, which although obviously they want to take it to a place where you can't go, because you're not interested in, I mean, me, I'm not interested in gay sex. I just, I respect everyone's rights and everyone's differences. And so if they're going to admire me for my physicality and tip me, and, and they tip me a lot, I'm going to, I obviously look at it like, well, thank you. I'm grateful. And I use the money for positivity, raise my family, scientific research, uh, studies, you know, improving myself, you know, being able to afford like seven grand for stem cell injections. I mean, I wouldn't be able to do that if I wasn't a popular entertainer. Um, it's, it's, uh, and that's the reason why I do it there. But at the same time, it's, it, it could be considered more lucrative because yes, you're dealing with men that are company owners, CEOs, lawyers, doctors. Um, the gay community is full of, you know, highly successful men that do not have children and therefore they have a higher income disposal and they they tend to have more time for recreation and their favorite form of recreation is is tipping muscular men so i'm like well, hey thank you I, I i love it i appreciate it and that's why you know i i would consider myself with the word metrosexual or i'm just very comfortable in my own skin if, if people think i'm gay i'm like well i don't care it doesn't bother me. I got a beautiful wife and kids, and um, it's really just a case of uh, when I go to work. I go to work almost like with Spartan mentality because I'm my own security. You know what I mean? I'm in the middle of a nightclub, and you know, without being without being crude, I got to watch my own ass. Literally, you know what I'm saying? So, <laughs> like, I got to watch my back. There's no bending over and picking up the soap. Um, and just it, it, no one really wants to violate you but when people are drunk they can cross lines and you have to find that way of like hey calm down you know without turning it into a violent situation you have to try and calm people down and prevent people from uh, you know sometimes you know there are big big dudes like man I remember one time I had a dude come in was a former NFL player it was like six, eight, six, nine, 300 pounds of pure muscle. It was a bodyguard to somebody. And he was like, I want you. I'm like, what? Well, you ain't going to get me. <laughs> but, you know, um, my point is that's literally why for me, like staying strong is also a part of my lifestyle. It's like, you know, I, I, I never want to be punked by other men. It's, it's like, um, that unfortunately is a reality in our world today that uh, you've got people losing their minds and some people will try to belittle others by putting other people down or bullying others. And I'm just not with that. I'm kind of anti-bully. I don't believe that people should bully gay people. I don't believe that people should bully anybody. Um, I mean, I have the ability to be a bully. I choose to not be a bully. I choose to be a a lovable type hero in my mind. That's what I'd rather be, you know? Um, and that's where I fit well at that, at that entertainment club. And um, I just massage, entertain, dance, and I'll even talk about nutrition. I have no problem talking about nutrition or science. And I've brought up, you know, Sean Baker's name many a time in the club at tables and told, you know, Many of these old men, you know, study Sean Baker. I mean, like, even my boss was like, dude, you know, you've got issues. You need to study Sean Baker. I sent the video of Sean Baker to the boss of the club because he had certain issues that he was battling. 
um, health and knee joints and whatnot. And so he's like, oh, I love that. I'm, I'm a carnivore. So, um, you know, m- my desire to reach out to Sean Baker, and it's nice to now know you as a Zach, as a, as a, a ultra marathoner, but my desire to reach out to Sean Baker and be on this podcast was more so that when I post this to my Facebook and I post it to my Instagram and I post it to my friends or family and people who are curious about me, they'll be able to tune in and see, you know, a big dude, a bigger dude, older than me, pulling stuff off like Sean does in that physical manner and maybe be more curious about their own health, their own wellness. Um, You know, because I believe that if we all, as a collective group, get healthier, we'll slowly make the world a better place. I mean, I feel that having a sound mind and higher testosterone and and a, a healthy self-esteem and healthy feeling mind, I, my mind feels healthier than it's ever felt before. Um, I can only imagine that improving society. You know, when you look at people. I study another guy named Dr. Daniel Amen who talks about brain function and he analyzes why people commit those mass murders and whatnot. Um, He speaks about a lot of nutrients being missing in the brain and holes developing in the brain. And he puts up a lot of images of holes in the brain, uh, Swiss cheese brains he refers it to. And with all humility, I feel that towards the end of my veganism, you know, probably my brain was like wigging out. Um, and so to, you know, I think I'm close to a year now back on animal products. I'm still feeling like I'm rebuilding. Like I definitely felt like, you know, the first week when you go back to meat and salmon was the first one I was able to do comfortably. I was like, wow, this is night and day. Thank God for this. But one year later, I still don't feel complete. You know, I still feel like, you know, obviously I got the stem cells. My Achilles is feeling almost 100% ready to sprint again. You know, I'm, I'm able to, you know, box squat over 500 pounds. I'm, I'm feeling like I'm getting ready to be the best version of myself again at 45, 46. So it's like a breath of fresh air, like... Thank God. And it's also like, you know, gratitude to Sean Baker for actually tolerating all the abuse. Because I don't really get that kind of abuse that I see you get from the vegans. Either they, you know, maybe they they respect the fact that I once was a vegan, so they don't attack. And I don't know, maybe I just don't engage in, if they do attack, I just block and delete. I haven't really got time to go back and forth. Um. But I, I do commend you for, uh, you know, taking the amount of shit that you have to take from a lot of these people that will call you names, you know, because you're kind of pioneering a path where you're putting it out there. Like, yep, I mean, nothing but me. And, uh, you know, I'm not apologizing for it. So I guess you're the poster child for that attack. I'm not. I'm, I've been a poster child for veganism. And now I think probably a lot of those vegans are looking at me thinking, you traitor, you're, you're on that podcast with Sean Baker, the, you know, the, what do they call you? You know, the lizard, the vampire, <laughs> you know, they probably now think I'm a lizard, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I'm probably a lizard or a vampire, but I, I truly see past it and see it more like you cleaned your health up even more than you had it because you were you know, a bigger, strong man before. And it's commendable that you're taking all that heat. Because I think, you know, let's say Joe Anderson, you said he's one of your mentors. He kind of did it quietly. So, you know, nobody really, you know, knows of him for 20 years. You, 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 you stepped to the front line like a Marine. And you're taking the heat from all the vegans. I don't take that much heat. And I could think, quite frankly... I probably would snap into a more of a like angrier tone quicker maybe than you. That's why I just have to cut off. Like, okay, I'm gonna have to cut that person off. I can't deal with that person. Yeah, uh, you know, well, obviously, yeah. I mean, I since I was on Rogan's podcast and got in front of a lot of people, and there's people that are just offended by the fact that I, I 
have the audacity to eat the same food that humans have been eating for three million years, and it's offensive. Yeah. Um, and you know, some of it's some of it's kind of entertaining to me. You know, some of it's just kind of silly. I kind of don't really. I've been through enough things in my life where somebody calling me names is not really <laughs> that big of a deal. I mean, I think anybody anybody that that gets any little bit of notoriety, there'll be people that want to uh, sort of you know denigrate or talk talk bad against them. Um, so it doesn't really make much difference, but you know, the, the interesting thing is, and, the, and, and more so than that, I mean, there's, yeah, I mean, that's in the background. There's always the people that are, you know, kind of criticizing, but I, but I've seen so many people just, you know, radically improve their health and their life. And I mean, some people come back from the brink of suicide and you know, just awful desperate situations and they literally change their life around hundred percent. And that's what kind of inspires me to keep going. And, and, and I mean, there's no more bigger reward than that. Quite honestly, I don't care what you know, what you do as far as finance, but I mean, just that feedback that you're really making a difference in people's lives and helping people is incredibly, incredibly satisfying. And it's what inspires me to do this. Um, Zach, I think we've got a lot of material here. Marcus, I want yeah. to thank you for coming on. It's been a, an interesting podcast. Uh, it's, certainly you're the first sort of uh, uh, guest of, uh, of your background. <laughs> you know, as far yeah. As you're to dance. yeah, yeah. We've got some interesting folks. We've had like Molly Schuyler on the, you know, world food competitive eater and different folks and different athletes, but that's nice to get a different perspective and appreciate this. Uh, let folks know where they can find you, learn more about you, social media and then any other uh, sort of uh, places you'd like to talk about. Yeah. Uh, my Instagram is Marcus.Patrick. Um, Facebook, Marcus Patrick. My, there's a lot of fake profiles out there from when I was a, uh, you know, soap opera star, but you'll see my profile will always have a picture of my family on it. Um, cause family is important to me. So if you are looking for the real Marks Patrick, you'll see my wife and my two sons and, uh, biohackyourfat.com is my venture business that teaches people, you know, training, health, exercise, and all of the things that I've discovered that definitely helped me remain youthful, at least youthful enough to you know, thrive in an industry that seems to, uh, you know, worship muscle and youth. Um, you know, everything that I've been doing it, that has led me even to Dr. Sean Baker is really just trying to find where longevity, health, wellness, strength, life force exist. Um, I find that life force goes hand in hand with earning. So if you've got life force, then you've got the law of attraction. That law, the law of attraction is, you know, the proof in the pudding, so to speak. So, um, you know, you're definitely one of the mentors to that. I appreciate you for what you're doing in the world as well, Sean. And it's nice to have met Zach, who's a, a marathon extraordinaire. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks yeah. a lot, Marcus, for coming on. We'll definitely uh, link all link your social media stuff to the website. And if there's anything else you want us to link to the show notes, just just let us know. But uh, again, thanks for your time. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. Hey folks, Human Performance Outliers podcast is growing. And due to the growth, we are looking to take on some new sponsors. So if you feel like your company or organization would be a good fit for our audience, please do not hesitate to reach out to hpopodcast at gmail.com. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast with hosts Dr. Sean Baker and Zach Bitter. If you enjoyed the show, please consider following us on social media and checking out our websites. Links to those can be found in the show notes. Also, if you have any questions or comments, please do not hesitate to shoot us an email at hpopodcast at gmail.com. Thanks again for tuning into the show.